technical difficulties getting things going. Um, and actually, I wanted to start in with everybody about how the connections have happened, um, if there have been any difficulties, anything that maybe other people could learn from, uh, from your experience with it. I had a student in my other class uh, who uh, ran into the trouble of using normal Skype. And, and like I had in the email, you need to get um, Skype for business. Skype for business is the app that the school's account is connected with that lets us do these like big Skype calls with dozens of people participating um, at the same time. And, uh, and you'll use your journal account. Um, and it seems like that is the most uh, smooth transition. If you click on the link, it'll hook everything up in the, the way it's supposed to be. So I hope that's helpful maybe to some people watching this on YouTube later who've had trouble connecting. Anyone who's in the chat today, um, any, anything that's been a, a complication or question about our new format, our online format for the class, anything I can help with? Good? Okay. All right. Well, I'm definitely happy. Uh, all the 11 people who are here today, thank you for being here. Um, ooh, one second. Thought I was going to sneeze, but maybe not, <laughs> in case that happens. All right. Um, another thing that I, I just wanted to make as a general uh, point of business, um, I uh, with all the complications... Ooh, there it's coming. Uh, uh. Maybe it's not coming. Oh boy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, probably just allergies. Um, now it's spring's happening. All the trees are blooming around. It's really beautiful here near my house. Um, uh, so the other the other thing that has kind of happened, uh, especially over the weekend, um, I've gotten slowed down on doing more. Uh, outline reviews and feedback videos for people and I, I just want to apologize for that I I, I want to have things done by the end of this week and uh, I'm gonna try to make that happen I, I keep saying this to you I just I appreciate your patience knowing that I'm doing everything I can here uh, <laughs> in, do expo markers act as a substitute for hallucinogenics no no and inhalants in general is not a good idea don't do it um, but but yeah, thank you for your patience with these. I'm trying to knock them out as much as possible. I should be able to get a whole slew of them done today because um, some of my usual uh, Wednesday activities are, are suspended right now. Um, so I'm going to try to get a lot more cooking there. Um, but I, I've gotten a lot of feedback out to many of you, but some of you are still waiting on feedback from me, and I hope to have it to you soon. And if you are... Well, I, actually, I wanted to make this announcement. If you are um, planning, uh, or you let's say you're in a situation where you're trying to plan for the end of the quarter, you've got stuff going on for other classes, life is complicated, et cetera, et cetera, and you're like, I really want to be working on my final draft early instead of more last minute, but you haven't gotten feedback from me yet, and that's slowing you down. That's that's uh, interrupting your workflow. Um, I please, please reach out to me and let me know if you're in that boat. If, if not getting feedback from me has slowed you down and prevented you from, from being productive as a student, that, that's like definitely something I'd like to avoid. And at the very least, maybe we can have a phone call or something, or I can, I can give you some kind of initial feedback that you can always kind of get more detailed feedback later, or maybe I can bump you up the queue a little bit. Um, I've been just kind of going through the outlines in the order that people turned them in to me. Um, so kind of first come first serve sort of thing, but that um, I, I don't want that to become a, a barrier. Uh, there's the all the on, setting up all the online stuff has been a little uh, time consuming and, and just thinking about the discernment process, emailing with administrators stuff. The, I, my my own work time has been um, affected by accommodating this stuff, but so that's what's up. I wanted to just report about that. Um, I remembered what I didn't want to forget yesterday, which is to pick up right where we left off. Um, and I, I promised you uh, for, for our discussion of Williams here that the next thing I wanted to talk about was an extension of Nagel's argument against rational fatalism, rational pessimism, anti-realist views, um, these reductivist views, say everything is biased, for example. 
I wanted to show you how the, the application of his objection that the position becomes self-defeating and applied it to descriptive matters, I wanted to give you an application into normative matters. Um, so that, that's where uh, I wanted to leave off and that's where I want to pick up. Um, if you have any questions though, or if we have any hanging threads from yesterday's session, or anything else that's going on in the life of the class, uh, let me know, chat. If you got anything, throw it out. How are we doing? Doing all right? It's lagging? Video's lagging? Audio? Cutting out a bit? It's better now? Okay. Okay. If, if, uh, if during the course of the lecture today things are getting a little weird or goofy, um, just send me, put a, put a note right there in the chat immediately so I don't start going off for a long time and then have to go back and redo it. I um, have a deal worked out with my neighbor for sharing Wi-Fi, and he's not home right now, so I can't go into his apartment and figure out what's going on with the router or anything. So we'll just kind of make the best of it. I, I haven't had any problems all day uh, or yesterday, but just sort of randomly right before class started, there was a, some it was wigging out. Okay, I, I'm not seeing any um, anyone asking any questions or having any hanging threads here. Uh, but I, I do want to encourage, again, more participation for online lectures is definitely better, uh, so it's not just me talking into the box. Um, I definitely uh, think that there's a lot of potential opportunity for that with this subject matter. Um, and and uh, the issues we're discussing with Williams and Nagel, so uh, by all means, jump in whenever you want. And again, uh, the little convention about like sending a text to say, hey, I got something I want to say if you want to use your microphone or that you've got um, something that you're typing up for a text submission that might take a little longer, uh, let me know and I can, I can make sure that there's space for it. Another piece of advice that I have, this was relevant for my, this happened in my political philosophy class this morning. Sometimes me like waiting for a minute of dead time while someone's like typing something into the chat uh, doesn't make the most sense <laughs> for keeping things going. Um, so. What I'm going to probably do is is try to keep the lecture sort of efficient here. But again, because I'm so interested in encouraging participation, I want to encourage all of you to not be shy in doing a callback to something that happened maybe a few minutes past. Or if you're like typing and working on something and trying to get a question articulated, um, but feel like, oh, now we're moving on and talking about something else, so we don't want to go back to that. Let's go back to it. Let's, let's um, err on the side of jumping around a little bit more just so we can get more of that participation. I think that would be valuable at the same time of balancing it with trying to fill up the, the time that we've got and use it in the most efficient way. So that's my encouragement. Don't be shy about being like, hey, like five, ten minutes ago when you are saying this, like I, a question about that or a comment about that. Um, let's do that. Okay? Sound good? Sweet. Thank you for the uh, affirmative responses. All right. Let's let's keep that up. Okay. So yesterday we were talking about how if you wanted to give a basis or an argument or justification for, um, are you still able to hear me? I just got some weird notification. Audio's good. Okay. 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 I just got, I'm paranoid now. <laughs> all right, thanks for your quick replies. Um, all right, wonderful. Um, so we were talking about this uh, treating some perspective as merely the result of bias and talking about how like science is biased too. Maybe it's biased from Western culture or something or our modern world in which science is so much a part of our lives that of course we give it respect and authority, but it's really ultimately not on any better footing than anything else. That accusation of bias as a way of undermining or deflating the confidence that we'd have based on reasons or evidence or the logic of, of our endorsement for those perspectives. Um, that, that's sort of the anti-realist strategy in that kind of an argument. But Nagel was saying that if you want to make those things stick, 
you're going to have to have some basis for your accusation of bias. And to do that, you're going to have to make the exact same kinds of claims as the ones that are being deflated by that accusation of bias. Um, so uh, to do to show that science has bias in it, you're going to have to make some objective claims about the basis on why we should think that that's true, which means doing more science. So that's fair. We said yesterday that's fair. That's fine. We it's not like we want to we the right course of action here is to ignore any possible concern about bias. But rather, the, what it does defeat or what it makes impossible is a position that would say, like, nothing is unbiased. Everything is biased, and so there's no rational authority that makes any perspective better than any other. So that's why we're just, you can't make objective truth claims about what's going on for everybody universally. Um, that's always impossible. Whatever is the cause for concern for why that can't happen, Nagel is saying is going to itself commit to making some objective truth claims. So you can't, we're, I used this language yesterday, you can't like opt out of this game. You're going to make objective truth claims. The only thing we really need to discuss is what do we have the most reason to believe? You know, where, what are going to be the assumptions that we start from for making these uh for putting together these perspectives. What is going to be a better or worse way of attempting to get at that objectivity rather than that there's some option to to say it's it's all relative or something like that. Nagel's saying there's no way to avoid that because as soon as you try to give any argument or defense of that view, it's going to end up making exactly the kinds of claims that it's saying you can't make. Okay, so that's, that's where the self-defeating argument uh, shows up again. It's different from what we saw from Plato. Um, Plato was concerned about whether the position, the thesis of relativism or these other kinds of anti-realist views contradicts themselves just in terms of what they're saying. But Nagel's getting into the contradiction based on what they could say for themselves to back up that kind of perspective. Um, so it's an interesting like wrinkle or twist on the old formula um, and maybe makes that, that concern about it being self-defeated um, it's self-defeating uh, stick even more deeply. So we talked about how to like criticize science in this regard would require doing science, right? Making, if you're going to try to undermine the objective authority of what science is aiming at doing, you're going to have to do more science. So you're going to have to make the same kinds of objective claims as those you're trying to deflating. And I wanted to give you another example that's on the normative side, on the claim about ethics and morality. Now Nathan uh, asked, are humans biased by nature? And if we're using the definition that I offered uh, earlier about bias being any kind of irrational or irrational influence on belief formation, so when we, when our what beliefs we actually endorse are influenced by things that are not on the basis of evidence or argument, if that's bias, there are a whole host of forces that fit into that kind of category, including those that are uh, in our nature. So we have all sorts of cognitive biases, uh, critical thinking and logic has famously tried to make catalogs of these things, um, and it's, it's very fruitful and useful to do so. In fact, I teach it in my, in my informal logic class in critical thinking, philosophy 115. Um, we want to know about these things. We want to be aware of them. We want to have them on our radar so we can do something about them. But many of them are not malicious or ill intent or something like that. Um, I think the kind of bias people are mostly worried about when I just talk to people, norm like not necessarily philosophers or something, the kind of bias that seems mostly on people's radar are things like prejudice or particular cultural patterns that are more dogmatic or close-minded or um, that are that don't recognize other possibilities or something like that um, that might be more contingent and that might be the case um, some cultural contexts or circumstances might be more at risk for some of those forms of biases but there's a whole lot of other biases that aren't based on things like stereotypes or prejudice or dogmatism uh, or cultural conformism or anything like that. Um, maybe not based on social authoritarian systems or, or things of that nature. They're just kind of baked into how our brains work. Like we were talking with uh, Hume the other day about the tendency of custom to 
do induction. You know, like even if Kant's right and there is a rational basis for induction that would justify it, it's still true that we expect the future to be like the past in a way that may not be so thoughtfully arrived at or critically rigorous or something like that. It's just habits of thinking um, that are still going to get in the way of our objective truth seeking, but are not necessarily like scandalous, you know, they're just, so, so there's, there's probably going to be, um, there, there are sources of bias that are sort of universally, uh, a part of the human cognitive system. And then there's going to be other biases that are going to be maybe more contingent, um, that aren't part of the hard wire of our psychology, but that, uh, could differ from different places, time and places. Um, but I think, uh, if the question is, is bias a universal risk? The answer is yes. But that stops short of saying something like the anti-realist is saying that Nagel's criticizing, that everything that we do is like fatally condemned by bias, that there's no option for us to do anything other than this, or that the ability for us to participate appropriately in matters of objective judgment is impossible. That's, that kind of fatalism is what Nagel wants to defeat. How's this going? Making sense? How's everyone doing? A little catching us up to speed from yesterday. Going good? Okay. Sweet. Awesome. Thank you for the feedback. If anything pops up, you let me know. Questions, curiosities, comments everything uh, and people who are watching this on YouTube later will benefit from it as well so thank you in advance <laughs> all right so let's get into another application of this in our discussions around sorry about the buses Let that bus pass that's a bus I'm right next to a school um, yeah they've been running at weird times this week okay um, so when we talked about relativism in the past, um, I've mentioned that you could be a realist or a relativist or subjectivist about different domains of human inquiry or human belief. So a position that's somewhat familiar to me among uh, professional philosophers is they might be realists when it comes to descriptive truth, like scientific truths, things like that, scientific realists. But then when it comes to moral matters, they're like, yeah, there's no objectivity there. Morality is just, uh, we, I might have mentioned a position called expressivism before, um, which is a view that says all moral claims are not actually claims. They might look like it grammatically, but all they really are is just people expressing their feelings. So if I say torture is immoral, all I'm really doing, I'm not making a truth claim, not something that could be true or false. I'm just saying, boo, torture. That's all I'm doing, just expressing my feelings. And feelings aren't true or false. I mean, it can be true or false that I have a feeling, but the, the content of feelings like boo or something is not um, truth apt is the term that gets used. It doesn't take a truth value. Um, so this, this kind of view is out there, but Nagel wants to defeat them too, to say moral opinions or moral beliefs or values are not just bias. Um, it's not, it's not just a, a feature of the contingencies of feeling or something like that. This also has a realm of objectivity. And to try to say, oh, I'm not, I'm, we, people don't do this or they can't do this. And so we shouldn't do this. We shouldn't make judgments. We shouldn't operate under an assumption like there is moral truth that is objective and that we can make claims about what it is. Nagel's going to say, yeah, that's equally impossible. Just like you can't undermine or treat as everything biased all of our attempts to understand the world descriptively, you can't do this with normative judgments either. And I want to give you some examples of what this looks like in practice. Um, so Nagel, Nagel addresses one half of the scenario. I'm going to pull on him for one half, and then I, I, want to, I want to construct another half of this so you can see a comparison, kind of a contrast between two cases here. Um, but one of them is pulled straight from Nagel. So oftentimes um, you might have some, uh, let's, let's start the story here. You've got some uh, intuitions, some strong intuitions about moral things, like what is appropriate behavior and what's not appropriate behavior, what's good and bad and right and wrong, matters of, matters of ethics and morality. So you've got some strong intuitions about this. And you're like, yeah, yeah people shouldn't do that. That's wrong. Um, 
like uh, the example Nagel uses, is um, women going topless in public. So in America, people would be like, this is indecent exposure. We've got a law about this. Right? They, might, they might judge that and say, that's wrong behavior. You know, they might moralize it. But then, so that's just one example. But take whatever you want. You know, you could, you could do this on a number of different issues. Um, then you might take a look around the world a little bit more and recognize, hey, not everyone lives in an American culture. Not everyone has the same values or social expectations that we do here. Um, there are contingencies about this. You might study abroad or travel or get to know people from different cultural backgrounds and communities and recognize there's a lot of other forms of life out there than the one that you're familiar with, that you have intuitions for, and maybe in recognizing that things happen differently in different places, you might start to lose some of your confidence in your original moral intuitions. So the way Nagel tells the story here, it's like you might look around the world and find there are cultural communities in which women going topless in public, not a big deal, not a problem. Doesn't They're fine with it. Um, and then it might be like, well, maybe our own problems with it in our own culture aren't really so objectively valid. Right? Maybe those intuitions lose some of their force or their authority in determining what's right and wrong and what's good and bad. Following the story so far? How are we doing, chat? Sound plausible to you? Do you have this experience? I mean, knowing about these other cultures might not change the way you feel, but it might change how much authority you give your feelings or intuitions as evidence of what is objectively good. Is that a, 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 a experience anyone has had personally? Does this sound like a familiar encounter? Definitely, Nathaniel says, yeah. Can you get, can I give another example? Yeah, sure. Um, so um, here's an example. There, there's lots of cultural diversity to talk about that would probably fit into the same kind of category as the one that Nagel is bringing up here with like women going topless in public. Um, take something like um, in America, we generally, not universally, but in American culture, there's a little bit more of a value on individual expression and sort of bluntness and honesty, like people being straight up with others, being like, I didn't like that, or I, don't, I didn't like what you just said, you know, or something like that, or like, I'm not happy with what's going on right now. People being like more candid and uh, full disclosure, right, and wearing their heart on their sleeve and this kind of thing, rather than bottling stuff up or, or holding it internally. But in other cultures, there's a different set of values and expectations for people's behavior, where now being honest or being more blunt would be extremely rude or disrespectful or communicate something like uh, an insensitivity to others or uh, self-obsession or something like that, right? And so you might imagine, no, nah, it feels right. Like, yeah, I appreciate when people are candid and honest with me. And then when you're working in some other kind of cultural context, where there are different values, you're like, oh, wait, oh, yeah, people do things in a different way. And maybe the way that I'm used to doing it or what my my kind of community culture is like um, isn't objectively right. It isn't how people ought to act sort of universally and objectively. Does that help, Bernadette, that kind of scenario? I could probably come up with some others here, too. I got to design them in a careful way because there's going to be a contrasting case. Um, so, and other things I might think of are not actually going to fit into this category, but into a different category. But just to kind of summarize this again, in this scenario, things go the way, say, the cultural relativist might suggest that they're going to go. That you have some belief, you've got a, a commitment to something being objectively right or wrong or good or bad. And then you become aware of what happens elsewhere like other people's perspectives, other cultural patterns that exist, 
and once you're aware of that, then the original authority sort of starts to uh, fall away a little bit. That, oh, maybe the reason why I think that's so objectively right or wrong is just because of the culture that I'm a part of, that I've been enculturated into these values. And when I recognize that there are other cultures that have different values, then I might be second guessing my own values a little bit more here and be like, maybe they're not right. Not everyone believes in this. So now I don't have the same confidence I had before in my objective truth claim about what's good and bad and right and wrong. So that, that's the big idea here. That going, going down well? Okay, okay, all right. Thank you for, for checking in and, and letting me take a pulse. I can't see the room. I can't read the room anymore with it being online. Um, I rely on that so much. Okay, so second case. So in that first case, that seems pretty plausible, that we, we might still be uncomfortable uh, with women going topless in public. Maybe individual people are like, yeah, I wouldn't do it, you know, or yeah, it makes me feel weird when it happens. But you your attitude about that's different. You're like, but it's not because it's like objectively wrong anymore, because I'm like, ah, maybe other people can do it and that's fine, you know, um, or other cultures can live their way and that's fine. There's no absolute ethics about this decision or this behavior. Okay? So it might work out that way. But contrast it with another case, and then I'm going to come back to that first case to show how Nagel is going to make a, a kind of theoretical argument here. So here's another case. Same kind of setup. There's something we have conviction about that we think is about a matter of justice or morality or ethics. And then we find out that other people live differently and that other cultures work differently. But in this case, it doesn't seem like our initial confidence in the judgment we made or originally is threatened or undermined or deflated by the awareness that there are different cultures out there, that people have different intuitions about things. Um, it doesn't seem to blunt the force of our original conviction. And so uh, the case I have in mind is a very dark case, so I want to apologize in advance for this. This is a very, very serious issue, and I do not want to be treating it in a flippant sort of way. And it's a really messy one, but it, it's, a, it's a perfect example, I think, of what Nagel is trying to get at. And it's sort of thematically related to uh, his initial example of um, cultural conventions and ethical standards around women. Uh, in particular. Right, we could choose other su subjects here too, but Nagel chose that one, and I was when I was thinking like, oh, what's a good contrasting case to get what this other part that Nagel talks about theoretically but doesn't give an example of, and my imagination landed on, um, and sometimes ethics goes real dark. I mean, this is what I say to all my ethics students when I teach it. It's like, it's not just about all the happy ideal stuff, but also about how how rough things can go. So I, I needed to pick something that was adequately rough enough to get it to fit into this category. So enough beating around the bush. The situation I'm imagining is what's sometimes called female circumcision, but I think a much better term for referring to this is female genital mutilation, which is a kind of cultural practice. Um, in, in some cultures, it's actually, uh, from the time I actually started teaching 10 years ago, the global instances of this have gone down. It still exists, but in some parts of our world today, but it definitely is on the decline, but historically it's been more present, but it, it's a cultural practice of like a surgical removal of a clitoris or sewing up uh, a vagina until marriage. This is about, it's like related to chastity values, and um, but it, it is, like I said, I think the, the proper term here is not circumcision because that gives a Although there's, there's issues with male circumcision, too, that we can talk about ethically, um, and people, philosophers do. But female genital mutilation really feels like a much more apt term to describe what's actually going on. And when we hear about that, like if that happened in America, CPS would get called. If like parents did this to their child, there would be severe legal consequences and moral outrage. I'm, I'm guessing you're going to agree with me on that one. Um, given the culture of America, 21st century America, if someone did that here, it would not only be illegal, it would definitely be considered immoral, and people should not be doing this. And we'd feel probably pretty strongly about that, that this is a kind of abuse. But then, just like in the first scenario, we become aware, hey, there are other 
cultures that practice this. And one of the sort of um, tragedies about how this has played out historically is or one of the things that makes it kind of messy is that this isn't, I mean, it is about oppression of women, but women also participate in it too. That they, they elect to do it or that there are cultural norms here that support that, um, that it is uh, performed um, by women and not just men um, doing this to women. Um, but this is, it's part of a cultural fabric. It's part of um, the life that people live and how they make meaning and have values about it. And when we're aware of that, they're like, here are these other cultures and they're doing this and they don't see a problem with it um, and they think it's right to do it, that that doesn't change our conviction that there's something like seriously wrong about this. And it, we, we might be inclined to say things like, we don't care if that's the culture, it's still wrong. This like objectively is wrong. Um, and the presence of diversity and opinion and culture about it doesn't seem to change our minds in the same sort of way. Okay, is this scenario making sense? Um, chat, still with me? Yeah, okay. Okay, okay. Let me know if you got some questions. Here's why I'm bringing up these two contrasting cases. Nagel wants to say, if you want to use an accusation of cultural bias as a way to deflate the conviction or confidence that we have in an objective moral claim, you're going to actually have to make the same kinds of claims as the claim that is being deflated. So if it's about one of these matters or the other matter, there's going to have to be some hidden ethical prescription about what we ought to do with the fact of the cultural diversity, for example, or these forces of cultural conformity. In the fact that something is culturally conditioned doesn't necessarily mean that it ha that there is no argument to be made. The way Nagel describes this is he says, sorry, the buses are going again. Um, I had a garbage truck earlier uh, <laughs> in my first class period, and actually that's going to be my code word for today is garbage truck, but we did this and this seemed to help a little bit. Is that working for everybody? The bus noises aren't overshadowing my, my talking? Working good? Okay, cool. Seemed to work this morning. So code word today is garbage truck. That's your code word for the lecture today. Um, I didn't want to do it before I forget about it. Um, oh boy, the whole caravan's happening now. Okay, we'll keep going this way if it's working. Um, so when we are confronted with the evidence about diversity of opinion, what Nagel thinks happens in, say, the first case, like the case about women going topless in public, is that once we're aware, oh, hey, there's some other options here, um, and then I rethink, I've kind of put the critical scrutiny to my original assumptions, and I'm like, is there anything really morally, objectively morally relevant about this convention? Um, maybe Americans are too immature culturally to be able to handle women's bodies because they're so sexualized and there's all this other sexism that's coded into uh, the, the female body. That's maybe why like we can't handle it or we got so many problems about it or it might be unethical for our circumstances. But once I'm looking at what's happening in other places and seeing what the other options are, I'm like, yeah, maybe there isn't a whole lot of objective weight behind my feelings, and they really are just cultural biases and nothing more. That, that could be possible. But that also is making an objective value judgment, that there isn't anything that makes this claim worthy or that really backs it up, that it doesn't hold a whole lot of argumentative weight, that it can't lay claim to being sensitive to something of true objective moral importance, and that's why we lose the confidence, not because of just the awareness of the diversity, but because of a moral judgment, a new moral judgment that the awareness of diversity prompts me to make. It's still objective. That's Nagel's big point. That's why I wanted to construct this other kind of contrasting case where it works differently, where when I'm aware of the diversity of culture or opinion, and I'm looking at it a little bit more critically and being like, is my opinion just a matter of I'm in a culture that's not comfortable with this, where this isn't the norm or this isn't useful? And I'm like, 
No. <laughs> There's some real substantive moral concerns about something like female genital mutilation. Um, we can talk about bodily autonomy. We can talk about the harm that happens to people, the way in which this is done without consent in many cases. But even if it was consented to, this isn't maybe, uh, this would be um, a kind of way in which someone could do something that harms themselves, and that's unethical. I mean, there's a lot of weight that we could put into why there is something to the intuition and that the reason we have it is not just because of what's normal for our society or for our community or for our culture. That there is some objective weight here that can be connected with and that we could uh, acknowledge or be responsive to regardless of our cultural background. That someone who's in a culture that does practice female genital mutilation and where it is acceptable, that they've got a, there's a basis of how they could make an argument to their own community. Hey, we shouldn't be doing this anymore. Or this is bad. Right? To criticize it. Um, another uh, thing I usually um, like to bring up here as another illustration of Nagel's point is that oftentimes we are more hesitant to cast judgment on what's going on with other cultures. So sometimes the attraction for something like cultural relativism is because we we don't we're like yeah I can't judge some other some other culture, but we don't usually hesitate in judging our own culture, right? The like American culture, like do you think American culture's got all the right answers about everything, or that because this is just how our culture is, that defines what's right and wrong, and there's no independent court of appeal about this? I really doubt that. If someone in the chat wants to be like nope, I'm like. Everything about American culture is right, and not because of any objective claims, but just because that's the culture that I'm a part of. I'd be very surprised. Feel free, though. I don't want to like, prejudge anything here, but it's a lot harder to maintain. And if you are going to say that there's concern about bias, you're going to have to be importing some other normative claims about what we ought to be doing or how we ought to be living that isn't like that, if that concern about bias is going to have any real teeth to it. Which connects to the thing I've, I've said before, maybe we're in a better position to understand this phrase now, to say that most of the time the concerns about bias um, are most relevant in the context of something like realism or rational optimism for people that think there is objectivity and we want to make sure we're getting closer to it. Okay, so that's Nagel's argument now applied into the normative sphere of ethics and morality about how um, if you wanted to criticize a moral perspective on the basis of it just being at the result of bias, for that to mean anything, to make the cultural, or the, to just the descriptive observation about the cultural circumstances that that perspective is in line with, you're still going to have to do more before that's going to defeat the confidence or conviction around that objective claim, and that's going to mean making objective moral claims yourself. Um, how's this going? Oh, something else I can say that's helpful here. It's important to recognize that saying things are permissible is making an objective moral claim. Objectivity is not just about people saying something is immoral or wrong or impermissible and can't be done. If we say, yeah, I guess there isn't any big moral difference between whether women go topless or not, like, or that we had a culture that was treated that as acceptable or not. It doesn't matter either way. There's no ultimate right or wrong about it. You're still making an ultimate claim about what is right or wrong by saying, these options are all equally morally permissible and available. Um, uh, to be an anarchist is not to not have a political theory. You do have a political theory. You just say everything is permitted, <laughs> something like that. Um, that's, uh, that's maybe another way to make the same point. So uh, I have yet to see someone present to me an intelligible picture of how someone can go through their life without making any moral claims, uh, objective moral claims whatsoever. So this is another part of Nagel's claim about how you can't get outside of the game. Okay, um, people in chat, how's this going? I, not many people have been asking any questions or anything, so I'm just like, how's it going? Okay, okay. All right. Okay. All 
Looks like Nathan's got a message coming in here. While he's typing, um, I think uh, what Nagel would encourage... Oh, here we go. If you could summarize what we went through in this lecture, how would you say it? I would say um, Nagel is saying that the idea that everything about morality, that there is no objectivity to morality, that it's all just the result of contingent local cultural biases um, or biases of individual experience or something like that, is not a position that can be sustained. Um, because the way that it's going to try to critica criticize making objective claims about morality or that there is a space of objectivity about morality is going to end up invoking objective moral claims themselves. Um, another extension of this was an argument I offered when we discussed uh, the Plato Theotetus reading and that treatment of, of relativism. Um, that if you value tolerance, relativism doesn't give you a basis on saying tolerance is an objective value. Um, that if you wanted to say, well, because there is no objective universal moral truth, then you can't criticize each other, that itself is making an objective claim about what we ought to do given the facts of cultural diversity or something like that, right? And that claim would also need to be defended in the face of the other kinds of objective moral concerns that people might have, like that cultures are not the final arbiters or authorities of proper behavior um, and that there are universal grounds for being concerned about how we treat each other for the sake of justice or the sake of compassion, um, that there are, are ways to justify those values independently of a question-begging appeal to a culture that someone is already a part of or already finds intuitive. And I, I said another that someone asked me yesterday, I believe, about like, how do you argue for the objective validity of moral claims? And I said, take an ethical theory class. <laughs> I would say that again um, today, but uh, there, there are options here. The point is that even without considering them, you're going to have to go to toe to toe with them at some point if you're arguing for some kind of universal tolerance based on cultural diversity. Um, the kind of movement that a cultural relativist may want to go into is still there if they're saying they're not making objective prescriptions they are they still are they're still in that game and if they're gonna play that game with uh, critical accountability and rigor then they have to confront um, and the uh, the uh, claims to objectivity that other perspectives have about what we should do with moral matters so you can't opt out of it that, that's it's the same theme from yesterday just applied to morality um, Nagel saying you can't opt out of making objective moral claims. Uh, so the only question is how responsible are we going to be about it in terms of critically thinking about them and asking for grounds of justification. Um, that took a lot longer than I was anticipating. I'm, the time today has just evaporated. Uh, we have three minutes left. Um, the buses are back. Um, and we still have so much more about Williams to talk about. Now, I already kind of knew we weren't going to get to Wittgenstein today because we lost Monday. Um, but uh, I still want to talk more about Williams and Nagel tomorrow. There's some really important things. Um, maybe in closing here today, yeah, I agree, Bernadette. That was way fast. I can't believe how fast this class evaporated. Um, but I, I want to give you a little sneak preview of what we'll do tomorrow here. Uh, we can get started on it even with just a few minutes left here. Um, so Williams is going to look, we've been talking about Nagel and Nagel's argument. Williams is doing a review of this. And Williams basically says, yeah, you're right, Nagel. You're right. You're right that we can't avoid making objective claims, that we can't opt out of this game, that we got to get into um, a critical evaluation, and you can't just throw around accusations of bias to shut people's uh, claims to objectivity down, um, basically because we, there's nothing else for us to be able to do, that we are stuck in this the way that Nagel thinks we are. To deny or renounce making objective claims is actually not rationally possible. Um, but, but, William says, how much have you actually accomplished with this argument, Nagel? You might have defeated the global skeptic, or the global relativist, or the person who wants to say it's all bias. But what if we didn't want to say that? 
what if we wanted to say bias just sometimes happens? Nate Williams is trying to say there's more to this puzzle than maybe Nagel is respecting. And one way that he gets into this is by showing some charity for the relativist, for the rational fatalist, and in the same way that when I, I've talked about this subject before, I was saying I think this is appropriate. You can't just dismiss these views as being wrongheaded, even if those criticisms are apt and they stick, you know, like they're, we're like, yep, I guess relativism is dead. That can't be the end of the story. Williams, at one point in the article, says to Nagel, um, do you have any idea, or I'm paraphrasing, but it's like, does Nagel have any idea of what leads people to be relativists or to be rational fatalists in the first place? Nagel, uh, Williams thinks it's not by accident. It's not like this is just bad, wrong-headed thinking or people are just freaking out or getting paranoid or jumping to conclusions. It's that when we actually do try to do objective truth seeking in a serious way, we run up against these concerns about bias and then we're like, uh oh, how much of what I'm doing is biased? Not maybe that all of it is biased, but trying to figure out which parts are. If, even if I know that I have to play the objective game, I could be pretty concerned or I could have a, a lack of confidence that everything that I'm doing is fully objective. I mean, that would seem to be arrogant. Um, and just ignoring the actual risks that are coming in the territory that we're dealing in. So um, Williams is saying that's helpful to, to recognize this, that the relativist or the fatalist, the anti-realist, doesn't um, just sort of get... Uh, hoodwinked into adopting this extreme view that there are some good grounds for concern that lead them to this and maybe the argument doesn't follow right the conclusion of fatalism given these concerns is not a good inference to make and Nagel's argument does a good job of showing why you can't go that way with it but Williams is kind of saying even if those premises don't justify that conclusion those premises might be true and maybe justify some other conclusion that's a little less extreme than the one that Nagel is targeting so much. Um, it's much more balanced. Um, uh, oh, yeah, I'll get to that. Um, so uh, that, that kind of... Williams is going to try to encourage some uh, even-handedness here or some blunting to the force of Nagel's original argument that maybe it's not as powerful as effective as Nagel might think it is in terms of making objective truth seeking safe from the specter of bias. Um, Williams is like, no, there's still a lot of concern about this. And Williams is going to disagree with Nagel on one very particular and important point about what it means, what's sort of the upshot of Nagel's argument, of what does it mean for us as objective truth seekers, what should be our takeaway message about this. So. We'll get into that tomorrow. Maybe we'll be able to start some Wittgenstein. Uh, I will be very understanding and accommodating as far as reading comments coming in late on this one uh, for Wittgenstein just because our schedule's been goofy this week uh, with all the complications. So um, Hudson was wondering when we should receive a response feedback video for our paper outline. Um, at the beginning of the lecture today, uh, I, I, I did say I want to have them done this weekend. Um, that's a sort of deadline I'm setting for myself. I got delayed with all this stuff we've been dealing with lately um, slowed me down. I'm trying to get a big chunk of them out today. Um, if you want to check in with me, Hudson, where you're at in the queue, because um, I've been going through them just in the order I received them, feel free to reach out to me about that and I can let you know. Um, if you're wanting, if you're really itching to get started on this um, and get rolling and you're waiting on me, um, then definitely contact me and I'll see what I can do about that. Okay. Um, I'll let everyone go because I know you got other stuff today. Uh, that's that's it for our official session. But if anyone wants to stick around and ask me some more questions, by all means, um, I'll, I'm here. I'd be happy to talk more. You're welcome. Have a good rest of your day too, Lucas. Huh. Thanks, Nathan. Yeah, I, I mentioned that uh, this class is going to start kind of doing some of this, you know, full circle stuff. Like we've 
we've had a lot of ideas out there and and you've got more resources now for coming to another issue that's a little new it's a little different some new territory but you've got all these other resources for making sense of it yeah Anyone have any other questions or comments, things you want to discuss? I'm still here if anyone wants to talk. <laughs> 